everyone. Welcome to my talk on fibrous zinc sulfide from the Frank Encore in Montreal, Canada. Uh, my name is John Fink. I am a senior at Miami University and I work in John Rackerman's group. So with that, let's get started. When I mentioned Frank on Corey, you might all be familiar with that. It is a very famous uh, collector's locality, and it also has a rather unique mineralogy. So I took this excerpt from Mindat.org, which states that the island of Montreal is overlaid with limestones, which have been intruded by the Mont Royal alkaline inclusion. And related with that are numerous sills and dikes, uh, an example of one of these sills is in this image to the right. It's sort of this off light colored uh, splay. So at Frank Encore, there are 79 valid mineral species, and this is owed to uh, the very unique mineralogy and chemistry that is present here. Uh, even more interesting is that Frank on is uh, type locality for 10 minerals. And this is very unusual. This is a quite a large amount of type locality minerals for one area. So this gives you a sense of how unique the mineralogy and the chemistry of these rocks are. This is what typical material from Francon looks like. It's a silicified limestone. So it's very hard, but you can notice this picture on the left and even on the right are these vugs or void spaces. And this is where uh, minerals begin to precipitate out. And mineralogy can change from even vug to vug in this case. So you can have very different mineralogy uh, just centimeters apart from one another. And that's something that makes this locality very unique as well. Some examples of minerals where their type locality is Frank Encore. Uh, Franconite is obviously from here. It's named after the quarry, and it has a rather unique chemistry. Loganite is also a rather famous mineral from this locality because uh, they form these beautiful hexagonal prismatic crystals. Tresserite is another mineral uh, with, again, another, a very unique chemistry associated with it. As you'll notice, the title of my talk was on zinc sulfides, and there are two, sphalerite and wurtzite. These are polymorphs of each other, sphalerite being isometric and wurtzite being hexagonal. There are images that exist of sphalerite. Uh, I've taken one and put it in the upper par portion of the slide. Uh, and sphalerite that comes from Francon has a typical coloration and luster and morphology that you would see in other sphalerites. However, uh, there are no images previously recorded on wurtzite from Francon Corey. But there was one instance of someone who reported a single crystal from Francon, and they stated that it had typical wurtzite morphology. In uh, very recently, uh, there's been some process material from Francon uh, that we have observed. And so we put it into the scanning electron microscope and did energy dispersal spectroscopy on it to determine its chemistry. And we found that it was zinc and sulfur. So it's a uh, zinc sulfide. And why are we interested in it? And this is what this material looks like. Uh, it is fibrous in habit. So we have a zinc and sulfur present, uh, and we have this fibrous ha habit. And they typically form, or always form, these conical bundles. This is another image taken by John Jayzak. And again, it uh, just shows you how unique uh, this mineral is. And you can see it has sort of an eggshell off-white uh, color to it and uh, silky luster. Often with these conical bundles, you'll also find this mineral. Uh, I shouldn't call it a mineral because it isn't IMA approved yet, uh, but it may be in the near future. 
but it has this simple chemistry of aluminum and either hydroxyl or fluorine. This is another beautiful image by John Jayzak, and I put that here because I think it looks like a Christmas tree. It even has the star on top. This is a backscatter electron image of some of these bundles, and this is just to give you another clear sense of uh, what these look like morphologically. This is another uh, backscatter electron image. And this is just to show you how uh, thin and fibrous that uh, these minerals are. We can uh, sort of zoom in further. This is a larger bundle, but the scale bar is still 20 microns. And so those uh, bundles are only a couple microns uh, in length, which is pretty amazing. I turned to Raman spectroscopy to uh, sort of pit and narrow down uh, what these conical bundles were. Uh, Raman gives you structural information, and it's a good tool to use as a mineral ID uh, footprint. And so I did a scan, and sure enough, uh, the scan matches with either wurtzite or sphalerite. We also turn to polarized light microscopy um, because sphalerite and wurtzite exhibit uh, distinct optical properties. So in this case, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but uh, here we've oriented the fibrous bundles parallel to the polarizers. Um, and this is known as parallel extinction. And this is a property that is consistent with wurtzite. Wurtzite shows parallel extinction, whereas phthalerite would just be uh, black uh, across the board, no matter what orientation you put them relative to the polars, they would be extinct. So this, uh, this shows us that this is most likely wurtzite based on the optics. We can also turn to single crystal uh, XRD and this is the most premier method to determine uh, crystalline structures. And so we just wanted to be sure. So I put the uh, information that we would be able to gather from single crystal X-ray diffraction for both sphalerite and wurtzite. Again, sphalerite is isometric, whereas wurtzite is hexagonal. The unit cell volume for sphalerite is uh, pretty well constrained at 158 angstroms which is, again, something that we could uh, tell using single crystal XRD. Wurtzite has a variable unit cell volume, and this is based on the type of polytype that it is. And I'll get into that more later. Our data show that the, uh, this mineral is hexagonal, and it has these prayers that I've put down here with the unit cell volume of 34 angstroms. Now, it's worth noting that with single crystal XRD, we're simply putting a model to the data. So we're trying to model what the data is telling us. And this isn't always perfect. But uh, statistically speaking, um, we most likely are modeling wurtzite because the data is consistent with wurtzite. We also utilized another uh, structural technique uh, known as electron backscatter diffraction. And these produce these bands that you can see on the right known as Kikuchi patterns. And these patterns can be indexed with uh, other minerals in known databases. And our EBSD patterns indexed with wurtzite. So again, we have evidence to claim that this is wurtzite. So if we have wurtzite, um, well, we need to determine its polytype because wurtzite displays many different polytypes. The most common of these is the 2H polytype. It is a hexagonal uh, 6MM point group, but the unit cell volume is 34 angstroms. And if you can think about it uh, structurally, and I'll get into this later, uh, the stacking is in an ABAB -AB sequence.
The 10H polytype would be the next most common one. Uh, and everything is the same except the unit cell volume is different at 395 angstroms. But still the stacking is the same in, in ABAB format. This is the crystal structure of Wurzite, and I'll get into stacking here. But as you can see, there are numerous ways that you could uh, stack a Wurzite uh, atomic sheet, if you will. And in this case of the 2H polytype, this is an ABAB repeat of stacking. This is different in sphalerite, where you have an ABC stacking sequence. And this is where some issues with our single crystal XRD data come into play. Because although we're modeling the data in the hexagonal system, and the unit cell parameters and the unit cell volume are consistent with Wurzite, if you put these parameters and leave them in the hexagonal system, you're left with an ABC stacking sequence. So no Wurzite polytypes have been observed to have an ABC stacking sequence, but Sphalerite does have an ABC stacking sequence. So we don't believe that this is a new Wurzite polytype. There could just be some uh, discrepancies in our single crystal X-ray data. And this could be, for example, if we put uh, a polycrystalline sample instead of a single crystal sample. And in this case, that's what I believe, because these fibers are, again, extremely, extremely thin, and it's hard to isolate a single crystal to get good data off of. So again, repeating what I just stated, uh, closest packing with a three-layer repeat. This is the ABC stacking. Yield, would yield cubic symmetry and the structure of sphalerite. And this is inconsistent with our optical data. And in this case, we should tend to trust our optical data more. And you could even make an argument that morphologically, these fibrous bundles are still very similar to Wurzite. This image on the left is another John Jayzak photo. And this is a morphology that you would often see with Wurzite. And you can make the comparison that with these fibrous bundles on the left, that there is very similar uh, morphology which is this uh, sort of conical hemimorphic uh, morphology. So still, uh, questions and data collection remain, as with any scientific question. Uh, we simply need more material. We could also use some better si single crystal and EBSD data in order to properly uh, classify the structures of these things. Also, does each fibrous crystal show a crystallographic relation to one another? If you can remember, uh, each fiber sort of bundles together at a single point. And I'm interested to see if these bundles show a crystallographic relation to one another. Also, what causes the silky luster in the eggshell color that we're seeing? Uh, could this be organic material? Could it be uh, intergrowth of sphalerite and wurzite? Uh, many more questions remain with this project, and it's exciting to see what else we can find out about these minerals. So I'll leave you with this picture again. Uh, thank you all for uh, attending my virtual talk. I hope you all are staying healthy and safe. Uh, thank you again.